Amendment because I want my gun, but I have no idea what Article 6 says. If, you, if people knew what Article 6 says, we wouldn't be having the arguments on the news that we're having right now. The Constitution doesn't cover it. So, um, so we're going to do that because we want God to expect us to be patriots. He expects us to be Christian patriots. And if we're going to make a difference in this world and stand for God like we ought to, we need to know where we stand and quit being foolish about it. So uh, that's for free. Uh, if you want a copy of the transcripts of this, uh, you can send a check or money order to 6486 Serbia Elma. I don't have a transcript. I just said it off the cuff. See, I know good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's open the Bibles this morning to 2 Peter. Uh, 2 Peter. And uh, uh, we're going to be uh, looking at the passage of Scripture here. The Lord has pressed my heart this way. And so as soon as you find your place in 2 Peter, if you'll stand to your feet, uh, and we'll read uh, this passage, and I, I want it to be a help and encouragement to you. Um, God spoke to me greatly through this passage, and, and if some of y'all are still looking for Second Peter, it's right after First Peter. Why they call it Second Peter? And uh, and God spoke to me in a, a certain way on this passage of Scripture, and so we're going to read chapter one. Is where we'll be. We're going to read this whole chapter. It's uh, twenty-one verses. It won't take us long the way I read. So, 2 Peter chapter number 1, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith. Let's stop right there just a minute. Who are those that have obtained like precious faith? Well, it's the saved people, right? Amen. We've got like precious faith. What it took to save Miss Wanda, the same thing it took to save me, the same thing it took to save Paul, the same thing it take to save anybody today. So he's writing to save folks. Uh, with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through love. And besides this, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things though you know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard and when we were with him in the holy mount. We also have a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. We pray you'd open our hearts to it. Lord, I need your help this morning. I pray that you'd give me unction to function. Pray, Lord, for liberty behind this pulpit. Pray, Lord, for liberty in the pews. Open our minds and hearts towards your word. Let it change us and make us different. And if there's one here today that don't know you the free part of sin, God, please, before they walk out these doors, let them be saved. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You be seated. Thank you for your reverence to the word of God. 
We're in the book of 2 Peter. And of course, if you know anything about Peter, Peter denied Jesus three times. You can read that uh, over there in the Gospels where Peter denied him before the cock crow, thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Jesus forewarned Peter that this was going to happen. He forewarned him that uh, that there was going to come a day where uh, he was going to deny him. The Bible says over there that uh, Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have thee, that he might sift thee as wheat, but I prayed for thee. He said, and when thou art Convert and strengthen thy brethren. We know Simon Peter went ahead and he did deny Jesus, but Jesus said when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. So when you read First and Second Peter, you find Peter doing what God has told him to do. He's strengthening the brethren. You'll find First Peter speaks to those uh, that were scattered abroad by the persecution of those days, but written to save folks. Second Peter, likewise, written to those of like precious faith to save folks. He's trying to strengthen the brethren. Now, 2 Peter chapter 1 caught my attention this week because uh, it occurred to me as a Christian, as I was reading uh, 2 Peter in my Christian life, that most of my failures and most of my slothfulness is a result of things I forgot. And let me, let me rephrase this just a little bit. Perhaps not things that I've forgotten, uh, more things that I've let slip from my mind. Not things I don't know, Things that I'm full aware of, but for whatever reason, it's slipped out of my mind. Uh, I'll put it to you this way. The sermons that have been more helpful to me in my life were not sermons that taught me some new thing. They were sermons that reminded me to be doing the old thing. Sermons that struck my heart and said, you know what? We need to get back to this and we need to get back to doing this. And those things just resonated with me. And I said, you know what? That's exactly what I need to do. I need to put it into practice. But I find that most of your failures, most of my failures will be things that we have allowed to slip our minds that we know that we're not doing anymore. Why does this happen? Well, I'll tell you why it happens. It happens because of circumstances. Things happening in our lives that are out of our control. Things that come up. So often we react to circumstances instead of acting on what we know the Bible says. The failure today of Christianity is not how we act, but how we react. Uh, because reaction, uh, something at the spur of the moment sets us off and we react. And so when we react, we often do the wrong thing. Uh, I, I want you to realize that when things come up in our life from our perspective, they come out of nowhere. And we've not planned and we've not prepared and all of a sudden all we do is we find ourselves reacting to these situations and usually the way we react is not a biblical way to react to it. And we wind up in a position where we're defeated. Uh, because when we react, you know how we're thinking. We're thinking as humanity thinks. When we react, we're thinking in our human nature. Uh, for example, a bill comes due. Your car breaks down. Somebody gets sick. Humanity reacts in a couple of ways. The humanity thinks of what it can see and in the, in the concept of time. I see this is going on and we've got to fix it. We've got to fix it now. We don't have time to wait. We've got to do this. So and so sick, we need them healed now, the bills do, we've got to get that bill paid now. And, and then we think, what are we going to do about these situations? And our humanity says, do whatever you got to do. And so we react by doing things in our own power to try to fix it, usually with little or no result. Because humanity only thinks in terms of what we can see and time. Amen. The spiritual life is based on what you cannot see and the absence of time. Or not so much the absence of time, but the fact that God's in control of time. How about that? See, when we think spiritually, we think in the realm of, of the unseen. We're thinking in the realm of what God can do. And that God always does things in his time. And he always does things that are right. That's the way God does. Mary and Martha with their brother Lazarus as they stood around there. Jesus showed up. And they said, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother would not die. And uh, their concept was what we see in time. If you'd have been here, you wouldn't die. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Time don't mean nothing to God. Amen. 
He could have been dead 20 days and God could call him back. He'd be dead 20 years, God. Wait till the rapture happens and see these people that have been dead year after year after year after year. All of a sudden at the voice of God come up through the ground and rise up. Amen. Because God has the power to do so. And so uh, I'm not saying these things this morning uh, because I feel like I've got it all figured out. Because see, I still have circumstances in my life. And I still react sometimes in my humanity. And, and still, I don't always trust. But I say this as a gentle reminder of things uh, that, that the Bible teaches us. Now you say, what is the point here? My failures and my slothfulness usually come in areas of which I have forgotten or have allowed to slip my mind. Three times Simon Peter in chapter, 2 Peter chapter 1 said uh, uh, these things. For example, uh, down in verse number 12, I want you to see what he said. He said, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Notice what 13 says. I think it's me, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Notice what verse number 15 said. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be after, uh, able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. Simon Peter says to all of you of like precious faith, there's a few things I want to remind you of. Because these things slip our minds so often when circumstances rise up and we as God's people need to remember. And so that's what I'll preach on the this morning some things that I'd like to remind you of. Number one, for those of you taking notes, uh, notice what Simon Peter teaches us in this passage of Scripture. Simon Peter said, first off, let me remind you of this. Verse 3, it says, according as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He said, can I remind you of the power that you have? Can I remind you, child of God, of the power that you've got in your life? Could I remind you of that? That's what he's trying to say back. Now you say, well, uh, what exactly are you saying here? Circumstances get high, we react, but the truth of the matter is you're far more powerful than you realize. Amen. God has given every one of his children the ability to have a certain kind of power. Now you say, preacher, I, I know I've got a little bit of power to pray, and a, a little bit of power to do, a little bit of power to pray. Let me tell you something, the greatest power you've got is the ability to pray. The ability to step before the throne of grace and come before the Christ, holy God, and make your petitions known to God. That's the greatest power you've got. But I want you to know what Simon Peter said. He says, you've got this power, and I want to remind you of it. Well, what is this power? What exactly is the scope of the power that we as God's people have? All things that pertain to life and godliness. Whoa, 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 wait just a minute. You mean I don't just have a little bit of power? All things that pertain to life and godliness. You've got access to all the power you need to live a life, a good, clean life, a good godly life. God has given you the power to be able to do that. That's an amazing thing when we read about this. All things that pertain to life and God. We have and are equipped if we're saved to be able to finish this journey and not just finish this journey, but finish this journey well. Amen. Ain't that a blessing that we've already got that? Notice when you say, well, what is, what is all things that pertain to life and God? How do I uh, uh, hack into this power? Well, notice what verse 19 says. Same chapter. Simon Peter says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Now, what is he talking about here when he says we got a more sure word of prophecy? He's talking about the completed word of God. You see, back in the Old Testament days when prophets rose up, prophets would tell people what God wanted them to hear. But oftentimes it was a piece here and a piece there. And, and they had to do what he said today and they had to do what he said tomorrow. I, and this prophet had to wait on God to give it before he could say it because he didn't just know it. And so as God gave it, he gave it. Uh, but Peter says, listen, uh, we've got a more sure word of prophecy. We've got something more than just bits and pieces here and there. We've got Genesis to Revelation. Did you know that in the confines of Genesis and Revelation that all things that pertain to life and godliness are recorded there for you? Paul said over in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, verse number 9, he said, we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is done in part shall be done away with. 
Now what's Paul saying? He said there's some things we know partially now. He said that there's some things we prophesy partially now. But when that which is perfect is come, what is that which is perfect? It's the Word of God. When the Word of God comes, you say, well, why do you say it's the Word of God? Ain't Jesus the perfect one? Don't John 1, 1 say in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God? Jesus is the manifestation of the Word of God. That which is perfect is the Word of God. And when that which is perfect is come, that stuff we done in part is done away with. No more need for prophecy because God's gave us all the prophecy we know. No, no need for new ideas because God's got everything recorded in His Word. Let me assure you of something tonight that uh, uh, we've got the word of God today and the scope of all things that pertain to life and godliness is recorded in it and your power is contingent upon what you know that book says. Amen. And you can know how to live this life from that book and you can know how to live godly from this book. God said all that power is yours. Daniel didn't have the whole book. You know that? They were things Daniel didn't know. Even though Daniel chapter number 11, there's more fulfilled prophecy in that one chapter than there is in the whole of the Bible. Prophecy has already been fulfilled. Daniel could not see you and I. Daniel could not see the church age. He could not see this day of grace. As, hard, as much as he tried to see it, God would not reveal it unto him. But guess what? I know all about Daniel. And I know all about Abraham. And I know all about Isaac and Jacob. I know about Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea. I know about all these men. And I know what Jesus, what God did in the beginning. In the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth. I know what he said in Genesis 3.15. He said the seed of a woman to bruise the heaven serpent and bruise his heel. I know what Matthew said. Ah, here he comes. That one uh, through the seed of a woman, through a virgin, was conceived. I can see it, Jesus grow. I can see what Jesus said. I can read his word. I can read over there in Thessalonians when he said, uh, The trumpet's going to sound and, and the dead in Christ arise first. I can see how it all ends. I've got all the power right here Amen. in the palm of my hands. Amen. This is a day of ignorance, but listen, it's all ours. I want you to realize that. And notice also, not just this. The scope of our power is all things that pertain to life and God. How much power do you got? All the power you want. Notice what the source of it is. Notice what he says down here in the th verse 3 also. He said all things that pertain to life and God and this through knowledge of him. What is the source of our power? Knowing God. Amen. Amen. You say, what do you mean? Well, uh, uh, I want you to realize that our goal is to know God. Let me, let me give you a few things. What are you made for? To know God. Amen. What's your purpose in life? To know God. What does eternal life consist of? Knowing God. You say, why do you say that? John 17, 3. This is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. He said that's what the eternal life is, is knowing God, knowing Jesus. What's the best thing in your life that can bring you more joy and more delight and more contentment than anything else? Knowing God. Uh, what praises God more than anything else that you can do with your life? Knowing God. You say, why do you say that? Hosea 6, 6. He said, for I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt sacrifice. He said, I'd rather you know me than for you to bring every offering that you could possibly bring. Uh, everything, everything stems from knowing God. And if you'll get that part right, if you'll realize that that's your main business and main purpose to know God, uh, most of life's other problems will fall right into place. The Apostle Paul said, now I may know him. He said, I want to know if you want me to tell you why knowing God makes things in your life easier to deal with because you know what he does. You know how he acts. You know how he responds. And you know he's in control. Instead of standing around looking at circumstances saying, I don't know what's going on around there. Let me tell you something. Know him. Amen. It's an interesting thing. I've been married to my wife for 21 years. Now, I know uh, by comparison to some of you that's been married in this church, it's not very long, but uh, it's plenty long enough for uh, me or her to be able to complete another one's sentence. Right. It's enough for us that one day we were sitting around talking and we said, well, we're, we're going somewhere. And I looked at her and she looked at me and we said, I'm thinking about eating Chinese. And Avery said, you mean to tell me that you and her at the same time, the same thought, looked at each other and said, I'm thinking of eating Chinese. And I said, yeah, that's what 21 years of marriage will do for you. Yeah. 
Because I know her, she knows me. How much more so if we know God? To know, to, the Bible says, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself with no reputation, took on himself the form of the servant. I want you to realize right now, we need to think like God. We need to know how God thinks. We need to respond like God. I'm trying to tell you, Peter said, I want to remind you of the power we have. And that power is the source of it is all things, all powers given unto you. And he said, uh, uh, that's the scope of it and the source of it is knowing God. How do we know God? Read his book. Amen. That's how you know him. Uh, Peter also said this. Can I remind you of something else? He said, I don't just want to remind you of the power we have. Notice down here, verse number four, he said, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. He said, can I, prom can I remind you of the promises we've been given? Hey, can I remind you of some promises that God has given you? <laughs> well, I, I, if you want to encourage today, let me remind you of some promises you've been given. Now you say, preacher, how are you going to do that? Well, I did a little research. And I found in the King James Version Bible, there's 8,810 promises in the Bible. Now that's promises in general. Out of those 8,810 promises, 7,487 of them was got from God to us. So let me go over these 7,400. No, I'm not going to do that anymore. But you know what that means? That means that 85% of all promises in the Bible are from God to you. Amen. I, would, I would venture to say today that most of us could not name 10 right. of the promises that God has given us. Now, I'm not going to take the time this morning to give you all the promises that are in the Word of God because uh, there's a lot of promises from God to man, and, and uh, it would take us all day long just to go over there, but... but let me say with Peter, Peter said they are exceeding great and precious promises. And let me just give you a few examples. The first thing he says, they're tremendous promises. He said they're great. They're very exceeding, very great promises. You say, well, what kind of great promises did God make? Philippians 4, uh, uh, Philippians over in chapter number 4, verse number 19. But my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. Is that not a great promise? Amen. The Bible says, the promise of the word of God, my God shall, not maybe, could be, or if he wants to, he shall provide all my need. Not all my wants, but uh, uh, my necessities of life, God is going to make sure those are took care of. That's a great promise. Sure is. Truth of the matter is, you don't have the ability to meet her needs or these children's needs, but God has the ability to meet your children, her needs, your children's needs, and yours. Amen. If we learned anything during the coronavirus is we don't have the ability to meet each other's needs. But God does. God has the power and the ability to do that. He said that. Let me give you another uh, uh, promise that you may not know. I'm sure you don't know. Uh, it's out of Psalms 84, 11. It says, for the Lord our God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. You say, preacher, I can sure do a little bit more good in my life. Walk uprightly and he won't withhold nothing in front of you. Amen. That's a promise. That's a great promise. A tremendous promise. Here's another great one. My, one of the greatest promises in all of Scripture. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall, that's a promise from the word of God, shall be, is there a greater promise in the Bible Amen. No. than the fact that a thrice holy God would save your soul? I want you to realize, and he said not only, not only are they tremendous promises, great promises, he said they're treasured promises, he said they're precious. You know what a precious promise sounds like? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an example of a precious promise. It goes like this. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Is that not a precious promise? Yeah. 
How about a precious promise from Hebrews chapter uh, 13, verse 6, where it said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. See, there's been people in your life that left you and forsook you. I've got people in my life that I would call friends that have left me and forsook me. But Jesus said, I'll never do it. I'll never do it. Even times in my life when I looked around and did not know where he was, he was there standing somewhere in the shadows. You'll find Jesus. Job said, I looked on the right hand, couldn't see him, looked on the left. He said, I could not perceive God. He said, but I know this. He said, he knows the path that I take. And when I'm tried, I'll come forth. He knows where I am. Amen. You want me to give you another precious promise? Call unto me and I will answer thee. And show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33, 3. Is there a more precious promise than God said, hey, call me and I'll answer. I was talking to Zach the other day and I said, Son, I said call my house. I said, if I, if I look at the caller ID and I want to talk, I'll answer. If I don't, I won't. <coughs> I'm glad God won't do that. Thank you. <laughs> We live in days of caller ID and call wait. You remember back in the days when uh, 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 this is after phones uh, and after after community lines, but when you had just a phone in your house and you could only talk to one person at a time and nobody beeped in, nobody did nothing, you didn't know who it was, it just rung and you had to answer, see who it was. I miss the good old days. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to understand though. Can I give you another precious promise? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Is that precious? That when you're at death's door, about to cross over, I'll fear no evil, because thou art with me. Can I give you another precious promise, one of my favorites in the Bible? Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken from you up into heaven shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go. Acts chapter number 1, verse number 11. The angel stood out there and said, Hey, uh, you disciples, you keep looking. Jesus has ascended and he's done gone. Why are you standing here with your mouth gaped open looking for him? He's going to come back. Go get busy. One of the most precious promises in the word, word of God is that Jesus is coming back to get us. And I'm thankful for that. The, Peter said, Can I remind you of the promises of God? 7,487 7, of them that you can find in the Word of God that God has made you promises. And if we knew the promises of God, boy, we would never walk in, in, in defeat. We would never walk around discouraged, but we would rejoice in what God's given for us. Uh, can I also, uh, he wanted to remind us of something else. He reminds us of, of the power we've got. He reminds us of the promises we have. And then he says, in verse number five, besides all this, uh, given diligence, Add to your faith virtue and the virtue knowledge. And he goes through this chain here. He said, can I remind you of the process, the way we live our lives? Now, we learned last week, and some of you already know it, but I say we learned some things we learned. Uh, one thing the Bible teaches us is that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Did you know that? Amen. And last week in our service, we learned that faith without works is dead. We learned that. That's what the Bible says, and we know that. And so we've got a process here. Now, what is the process? Well, it's very simple. It's not pre-calculus. It's not trigonometry. It's not geometry. It's simple addition. You know what addition is? One plus one equals two. That's addition. God says, add to your faith. Now, I want you to understand that the first thing you've got to have is faith. But that is not the only thing you're supposed to have according to Scripture. God said, I need you to add to your faith virtue. You say, what exactly is virtue? Well, virtue is what we would call moral excellence. It means to be an honorable person. Uh, it means to live a life of honor, a life that's praiseworthy. That's what virtue means in this particular passage of Scripture. He said, I don't just need you to say I have faith and I believe God. Live a life that people can see your good works in your life and praise the God that you serve. That's virtue in your life. Some people, I could take you up the road now to people's houses, 
that are not in church this morning, that are living like hell, that you'll probably have to kick the beer bottles out to get in their house, and you'll walk in there and say, have you ever been saved? And they say, oh, yes. I believe God. I believe he saved me. Faith without works is dead. I'm telling you something right now that when we look at these things, there ought to be a little virtue in our life, a little honor about it. And God said the first thing that you need to add to your faith is virtue. Then he said, I need you to add knowledge to it too. What does that mean? Well, if you live a life that's praiseworthy and honorable, if you don't have some kind of knowledge about you uh, and, and, and how to do those things, notice he's not talking about academic knowledge. He's not talking about head knowledge. He's talking about uh, uh, heart knowledge. I remember reading the illustration years ago about this guy uh, that had went up there to, uh, uh, to a church and he stood in front of the church and he read Psalms chapter number 23. He was an actor, an orator. He, he come to do a dramatized reading of Psalms 23. And so he read Psalms 23 and he got done and there wasn't no clapping, no applause, no nothing. And so he looked at the preacher and he said, you're going to have to do something. So the preacher got up there and he read Psalms 23 out of his Bible and the altar filled up. And that actor said, I know what the problem was. And the preacher said, what was that? He said, I knew the psalm, but you knew the shepherd. Mm. You see, there's too many people today can say, and I can say that psalm, but they don't know the shepherd behind that psalm. They can quote John 3.16, but they don't know the God that so loved them behind John 3.16. I've had people come to me recently that tell me, boy, I've read my Bible and this and that. does not matter if it don't get in your heart. A head knowledge is not going to get you anything. Serving God's not academic. It's getting him in your heart and allowing him to do that. I want you to realize that. Then he said, add to your knowledge temperance. That means self-control. Get yourself under control. Amen. Stop your wagging tongue. Stop your lying mouth. Get yourself under If you can't control you, who's going to control you? The Apostle Paul said, I keep my, uh, uh, my body under myself. He said, I, I keep myself uh, 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 where I'm in control, where I'm maintaining temperance, especially after knowledge. You get some knowledge, you'll get real puffed up. Have some self-control. You didn't do nothing by yourself, and you can't do nothing by yourself. It's only through and by the grace of God that you're able to do it. Then he said, listen, I want you to add to your self-control and your temperance. I need you to add patience to it. Oh, no. Preacher, can we skip the patience just go to the brotherly kindness? <laughs> we need to learn to have patience. Most of your mistakes in your life came from you not waiting on God. Not waiting on God's time. Self-control leads us to patience. We need to be patient one with another. We need to be patient with God. We need to let God do what God needs to do. And we need to have that. He said, add to your patience, God, in this little life that people will see God through you. He said, add to that God in his brotherly kindness. That means treat others with the same mercy. They say, treat others the way you want to be treated. Hogwash. Treat others the way Jesus has treated you. Right. You treat others the way Jesus has treated you. I promise you, you'll treat them right. And he said, I have the brother in kindness, brother in kindness, charity. That's love in action. Let people see, not just you standing up there saying, I love you, but let them see that you love them. I'm telling you right now, that's what we need in our life. He said, so uh, when it comes down to, the, uh, uh, to our, uh, the process here, we need addition. And he said, if we'll do this addition, then we'll have abundance. He said that you may abound. Those are the words he used, verse number 8. Uh, for if these things be in you and abound, he said they'll make you that you neither be barren. That's abundance. You're not going to be empty. You're not going to come short. And you're going to have fruit. You know why you don't have fruit in your life? Because you don't have these things in your life. Amen. I'm just trying to remind you this morning. I could ask the question today, how many of you believe God? And I figure every hand in this building will be raised. But how many can say I added to my faith virtue and I added uh, uh, to my virtue that I added knowledge and I added to my knowledge uh, uh, temperance and I added to my temperance self-control and patience and I added to my patience brotherly kindness and I added to brotherly kindness charity. Or is all you've got that little bitty faith that says I, I believe God. There's one other thing here that Simon Peter wanted to remind you of, and I'm going to remind you of it, and that is 
what it says in verse number nine. He that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Peter said, can I remind you of the possibility of failure? The possibility of coming up short. Peter's about to die. He said, my deceased is right at hand. He said, but I want to tell you something. He said, I need to remind you of these things before I go. He said, I need to remind you of them so you'll be established in the faith. I need to remind you of these things so that you'll, uh, that you'll be strong. He said, I already know you know these things. He said, but I'm just trying to remind you. I need to remind you of these things because I'll be gone. Who's going to remind you after I'm gone? Did you know that if all you have is faith, if you've not added the virtue, if you've not added the uh, brotherly kindness, the patience, if you've not added all these things, did you know that the only thing Satan has to attack is your faith and you're at the bottom? And I'm here to tell you, church, this morning, that's the reason why some of you get to the bottom so quick, because you've got nothing but faith. I believe God. You've not added the virtue. You've not added the knowledge. You've not added the temperance. You've not added the patience. You've not added the brotherly kindness. And not all these things. But did you know that if you add these things to your faith, that there's a lot of other things Satan will have to attack before your faith is brought down to the ground. Yeah. You say, what is the purpose, preacher, of this? He said, if you lack these things, he said, you're blind and you can, cannot see afar off. You know what he said? You lose your vision. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Can I tell you something? He said you can't. He didn't. He said you can't see it far off. Do you know what you'll be looking at all the time? You lose your vision, your circumstances, because you won't be able to see past them. You can't see what God's going to do up yonder. You can't see that God's about to do something. He said if you lack these things, if you've not built on your faith, Satan comes and knocks your faith out from under, and you're at the bottom again, and all you can see is your circumstances, and you wonder why we can't get people to come to church on a regular basis. Because their faith has been rocked and they can't see nothing but their troubles and their trials and their problems. He also said this. Not only can you not see afar off, he said, not only would you lose your vision, he said, you're going to lose your victory. He said, you, you have forgotten that you were purged from your old sins. Now, can I make a very clear statement here? He did not say you'd lose salvation. He did not say you would forget that you're saved. He said you would forget that you were purged from your old sins. You say, what exactly does that mean? That means that we get to feeling guilty again over what God's done forgiving us of. Because we've not added to these things, and so we find ourselves sitting around wallowing in the mire over what we used to be. We get ourselves on, we get, we get back to uh, doing nothing because our old sin is a prison to us. Let me tell you something. I know what I was when God found me, but I know I am not that anymore. And sometimes I find myself in that position where I get to the place where, where I forget. Or I wonder, was it enough? I wonder if I've done things right. No, it's that's because we're lacking these things. We forget. We let things slip our mind. We've not built upon our faith. And if faith's all you got, faith without works is dead. Right, Satan will destroy it. You know what we begin to do? We begin to ask God to forgive us for sins he's already forgiven us for. Instead of having a productive prayer life, we're saying, God, forgive me of that because it's in our mind again. And you know what God does about that? Nothing. He can't. He already has. Yeah. What sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. From the book of life, they've all been torn out. I don't remember them anymore. We spend so much time saying, I, I've asked God to forgive me of that again, I just don't know if he forgave me. No, because he did 10 years ago. Why are we talking about it now? <clears throat> We're asking God to do something he cannot do to forgive something he has forgotten. He does not know what you're talking about. 
He has chosen to forget those past sins. And so then our prayer life becomes unproductive because we're not praying for our church members. We're not praying for revival. We're not praying for God to move. We're not praying that God would send us new members. We're not doing that because we're wallowing in our mire saying, God, I, because we forgot we were purged from our old sins. We forgot that what God does, he does forever. We forgot that our sins and iniquities would he remember no more. Peter said, I need you to remember, you've got a great power and you've got great promises. And there is a great process we must follow to add to our faith. Build upon your faith. Build upon your faith. He said, because if you don't do these things, he said, you're going to lose your vision. You're going to lose your victory. And I can tell you right now, there's hundreds of thousands of churches in the United States of America and the world today that have lost their vision and have lost their victory. We're not doing that here. We're not going to become one of those churches where we just come in here and warm a pew on Sunday morning and that's all the godliness we got. Help my or Baptist church, as long as I'm the pastor here, we'll never be that. Because there's more to this Christian life than that. You say, what effect can Elmire or Baptist church have on the world? I'll tell you what kind of effect we can have on the world. I shared it in Sunday school this morning. I'll share it with you today. I, I got a phone call yesterday, text message yesterday. Said, uh, uh, preacher, want to call, let you know, some kid for Hooper's Creek was on the radio today testifying. Now, Hooper's Creek is a church that joins us for youth camp. Philip Youngblood's church, and he's a dear friend of mine. They bring kids to camp every day. The boy testified on the radio. The boy said on the radio this. He said, I was about to kill myself. He said, I was going to take my own life. He said, until they took me to West Virginia, to that youth camp. He said, when I got to that youth camp, God changed my life. Mm. Yeah. There's a kid down in North Carolina that was going to take his own life, but because he come to Elmire Baptist Youth Camp, God gripped his heart and changed his life and kept Satan from taking a young man. Yeah. I've got a hundred stories just like that. You say, well, I don't know this. You may not, but I know these things, and that's why we keep going. And that's why we continue to do things. You say, well, preacher, I don't see much going on in this community. Well, I don't see a whole lot going on in this community either. And I'll tell you something about this community. Until this community can forget what happened at this church 16 years ago, this community will never do anything. But let me tell you something right now. What God's work is is further than this community. We're reaching the world this morning with the gospel through the internet. And people are watching. People are able to hear the word of God. And, and week after week, they're doing this. Elmire Baptist Church, not just some, yes, we're a little old country church, and that's fine with me. I like that structure. But this little old country church serves a great old big God. And God is not just limited to this community. God is bigger than this. And if we have our vision, then we have our victory. Amen. We need to have some vigilance. He said this, wherefore the rather, brother, Give diligence to make sure, make your calling and election sure. If you do these things, you shall never fall. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, make sure you're doing what God wants you to do. Yeah. Make sure you know you're saved. Make sure you're following your steps. Because if you'll do that and take these steps here, you're never going to fall. These are just a few things that we need to be reminded of. We're not a bunch of weak weaklings. We got power. All things that pertain to life and godliness. We got power through knowing God. Not only do we have power, we've got the promises of God. And those promises assure us of the power and assure us of the prospect and assure us of what God's going to do. We've got the roadmap, the process, the steps we need to take as Christians. We add to our faith. We grow our faith. That way faith ain't all we've got. We've got some things built on that. That way Satan can't just come and take our faith and we have nothing left. Build it up. He may attack your charity first, but if you've still got your faith, you can get your charity back. Amen. But we need to be warned. There is the possibility of failure. He that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten he was purged from his own sins. I just want to remind you. Let's stand with our heads bowed, eyes closed.